Um, so we are True Light Church, and uh, some of you have heard this story, some of you haven't, how this all got started. Um, late September, um, so like a Tuesday or Wednesday, I was on my couch, and in the morning I have my quiet time with the Lord, where I read Word and I pray. And I've always had a burden from this, for this town, especially since I was saved. And just I love this town, I love the people. And uh, that day, the burden was a little bit heavier, and I prayed to God, and I said, you know what, God, I can teach, you can do that gift, I can do that, but I can't play music. And generally, churches have someone who can play music, so I said, God, if you want to start a church here, I need someone to lead worship. So a couple days go by, and I see Max at church, and I was working as a youth pastor at Calvary Chapel at the time, and I hadn't seen Max in a long time. I didn't know Max that well. I just knew him as like a football player. He was like a jock guy to me. That's all I thought. I didn't know he played guitar or anything. And I saw him at church, and I started talking to him. And he, and he says, I play the guitar. And he's like, I've been leading worship. And right at that moment, I go back a couple of days right to the couch. It's like God took me back straight to that moment. He said, here you go. And I've never heard from God audibly, but that was the closest thing I've ever heard heard in my life and like I was in a daze I had no idea what was going on people were talking all around me and all I could think of was like here we go God and uh, so uh, I quit that job after that I prayed about it and I said God if this is what you want then make this happen your will be done and so I, I kept praying I was like make it abundantly clear if it's not supposed to happen then shut this door right now I just want to do your will and uh, God has done one thing after another and I'm not going to go over all of it today to make that happen. Um, so we made it abundantly clear, and I quit my job. I did that, and uh, here we are today. And I tell you the truth, this was the first day I've ever heard Max and Rachel perform or sing or play guitar or anything. And I would tell people this story, and they're like, you quit your job, you did all those things? And they would look at me like I was the biggest moron on the planet. And I'm starting a church, and I've never heard the worship team play. <laughs> And all I gotta say is, uh, I'll look right to the camera for this one. Uh, looks like God knows what He's talking about. And that was awesome. That was amazing. Like, I just like when you know God talks, you know God talks, and you just do it. You don't need evidence. God, God speaks. You do what He says. And uh, so I'm so happy you guys can make it. I want to thank Dan Shecker first and foremost for opening this up. Uh, we are in the middle of looking for a building, and uh, it sounds like this might work for a little bit. We just want to be good get together and worship together. So, I, so many of you guys I have relationships with and just to be in one place and worshiping the Lord means so much to me. And it's awesome. Um, so we're in the middle of looking for a building. It's kind of where we're at right now. And uh, I'll talk with Dan. Maybe we can keep this going until we do that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but anyway, um, we're a true light Christian church. And what true light means is uh, John 1 9 says the true light was coming into the world. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And that is what we do, we want to shine the spotlight on Jesus Christ. Uh, when it says that Jesus is the true light, it means he's the, the full revelation of who God is. The light is shown, and it shows us who God is, and uh, that's what we want. We just want to put a big spotlight on Jesus, and we want everyone to know about it. It's like uh, the song is saying, go and shout it from the mountains. That's what we want to do. We want to go shout it from the mountains, who Jesus is. And that is what we are going to talk about today. And we are going to go through... Um, the book of First John. And so I do what's called expository preaching, which means that I go through a whole book of the Bible. I don't just do a verse in the middle because, uh, well, if you're ever going to read a book, do you just start it in the middle of the book and start reading a little bit and say that's what the book's about? No. I think we just uh, we get best meaning of the Bible when we go through book by book, verse by verse. We understand what it says. So we're going to be in First John today. And plus, if I say I, I, I'm an expository preacher, I sound really smart. And that helps. I need all I can get. Um, so before we get into First John and the text for the day, uh, we got to do some background. okay? Because the um, Bible was written in a specific place to a specific people for a specific purpose. And so we've got to find the context so we can accurately know what John was writing about to begin with so we can apply that to our lives not misled in any way. Uh, I had a hermeneutics teacher in, in seminary, and he said there's three things that are very important when you're interpreting the Bible. It's context, context, context. And so many times we take it out of context. So we're going to look at the, the who, the where, the when, the what, the why of 
John, first John. So who wrote first John? John, John the Apostle. Okay, good John. Uh, John the Apostle wrote it. John uh, was a fisherman by trade. His dad owned a fishing company. Uh, him and his brother James helped out, helped out his dad. Uh, he was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Um, he was actually uh, in the inner group. So Jesus, Jesus had his 12, and then he had an inner group of three, and it was James, his brother John, and Peter. So he was around with Jesus for three and a half years, as close as he could be. And John knew him so well. Uh, so John wrote that. He also wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation as well. So the where? He wrote it in Ephesus. Ephesus is in current uh, modern-day Turkey. You can go there and you can visit right now. Uh, John was the head of the church there for about 20 years, and he wrote this to the churches at Ephesus. So when did he write it? Well, I have a little timeline of John's life here, and he wrote it about 85 to 90 AD is what most scholars think, which is basically it's the last book's of the Bible, right? It was by John. So, anybody tell me why that is? Well, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's because all the other apostles were dead. Uh, church history tells us that every single one of them but John was all martyred uh, by spirit, by cruci being crucified. Uh, his brother, James, was beheaded. And John lived through all that. And uh, by this time, when he's writing that he's the only one who's still alive. And, uh, so about 85 to 90 AD, we're going to look some more at John's life at the end here. What is it? So there's all sorts of different writings in the Bible. We have poetry, psalms, right? It's poetic. Uh, the Gospels are all like this historical narrative that tells us about history. Uh, this letter, this is a letter. It's called an epistle, okay? And it's, a, it's what they call a circular uh, epistle. And that means that John wrote a letter to a church, then they would copy it, and then they'd pass it on to the next church. And they just kept going from church to church to church. And why did he write it? Well, this is really what we wanted to dig into today. There's a purpose for why he wrote it. And we can kind of glean, as we go along here, we will glean about why he wrote it. He wrote it because there was a group of people. There's two reasons. The first one is there's a group of people who left the church. And they started to say false things about Jesus. They said Jesus isn't God. And they also said that his death means nothing. Also claimed to be sinless and some other things that we'll go over. But those were the two main things. They attacked the person of Jesus Christ. And that's important for us because the same thing's happening today. All around us. Let's go over a couple. Jesus is a great teacher. All right. uh, you will never offend anybody if you just say Jesus is a great teacher. Everyone believes that. Right? Uh, Buddhists believe that. Hindus believe that. Everyone believes that Jesus is Atheists believe that Jesus is a great teacher. No doubt about it. And it's true, he was a great teacher. He's probably the greatest teacher of all time. But it's basically like saying Michael Jordan was good at basketball. Okay? It's true, but you're not even getting to the point at all when you just say Jesus was a great teacher. Next, next thing we say of Jesus is he was a great prophet. That's true. Muslims believe that Jesus was one of the greatest prophets of all time. But again, you're missing the mark. It's true of him, but there's something much, much greater. Now let's get to some of the other ones that are uh, not so true. Jesus is a made-up character like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, You're not quite the top of me. Crying <laughs> kids in the middle of my first. <laughs> um, anyway, people still believe this today. All right, people still believe this today, and it's really absurd because if you look at it, there are atheist historians. The majority of all historians, whether they're atheist, agnostic, whatever, will tell you there was a man named Jesus who roamed the Judean countryside in the first century. He had a sometimes larger band of people who followed him. That's, that's just fact. It's history. That he died on a Roman cross. No doubt in that. That he was buried. That there was an empty tomb. And that his disciples said that he rose again. Those are all facts. Like, all atheist historians, for the most part, will tell you that. So the fact that anybody says that Jesus is just a made-up character that we teach our kids in Sunday school to get them to act right is absurd. And anyone who says that really needs to look into it. All right, let's look at some more. Jesus is a hippie. All right, 
<laughs> Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Okay? I've heard this. I don't know if you guys have. But he doesn't do us justice. Okay? He also said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Even if he would cause divisions in the world when he came. He also went into a temple and started flipping over tables and made a whip of cords to drive out all the money changers, too. So not the most peaceful all the time. Okay? Not it was about peace, but you're not a hippie. Okay. Next one. American Jesus. I'm going to break it to you guys. Jesus was not from America. Deal? Yeah. No. Um, the fact is that America didn't uh, uh, exist for 1,700 years after Jesus' death. And uh, somehow we get this, get this point. Was America founded on Christian ideals? Yes. Okay. Um, is America today a Christian nation? Uh, we should probably move on from that. Um, political Jesus, right? We, we say Jesus is a social activist. That's what he cared about. He was all about social activism, social justice. Or no, he was really conservative. He did this. Jesus wants you to carry a gun. Yeah. And really what it all comes down to, guys, is what I call selfie Jesus. <laughs> And it's this, what it is, is when we don't have a correct understanding of who the Jesus of the Bible is, we start to make Jesus look just like us. And he likes all the same things we like. If we like guns, he likes guns. Okay? If I'm a social activist, he's a social activist, and we make him look just like us. And that's not the true Jesus. Because the true Jesus, it talks about him all in here. So, those are just a couple of the ones. The, uh, the other reason um, that he wrote to, his, wrote to the churches was to say that it was just to reassure them of who Jesus actually was. So, first to come back, false views, and then second to uh, reassure the believers. So, let's go ahead and see what John had to say about who Jesus is. So, who is Jesus? Open up. If you have a Bible, I'm going to put it up on the screen too, so no worries if you don't have one. Um, I'm using an NIV if that matters to you. So, here we go. John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So John starts with three basic truths about Jesus. First off, he says Jesus is God. Okay, He says that which was from the beginning. He's speaking to Jesus there. He says He is before all created things. That, was, that person who was here before everything else, from the very beginning, very beginning, the uncreated. He's saying Jesus is God in as clear terms as he can. Um, he also calls him the word of life, which is kind of interesting. And if you know John's gospel, the beginning of it, it, it kind of says the same thing. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has become thing. And those are kind of some weird things to say, right? Why would you call Jesus the word? kind of an odd thing, right? So we've got to think about, like, what do our words do? What are, what are my words doing right now? Hopefully they're communicating to you. They reveal. They reveal my thoughts, my, my feelings, all those things. And so when we talk about Jesus as the Word, basically saying, He's the revelation of God. That's what it means. He means that God speaks through Jesus. He is the full re revelation to us of who God is. Uh, Jesus said, if you knew me, you would know the Father. But since you don't know me, you don't know the Father either. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, I am the exact representation of God in human form. So we've got to tackle something else right now. Um, something that's really big right now. A lot of this is apologetics today. It's just what John wrote. He wrote it for an apologetic reason. But one thing I hear a lot of today is that Jesus never claimed to be God. That we have made that up as a church, but that he never claimed to be God. So let's look as some of the things that Jesus said, just and I just picked three things. If you read your Bible, there's a whole lot more than that. I and the Father are one. I and God are one. Kind of seems like he's saying he might be God. I don't know. 
Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So this one we need some clarification. So Jesus is sitting, or speaking to a bunch of Pharisees and scribes and all these people. And uh, he basically says that he was around before Abraham. And they're like, you're not even 50 years old. And Abraham existed about 2,000 years before Jesus. So how could that be? Then Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And that means a lot. Okay, because back in Exodus, Moses was talking to this burning bush. He was speaking to God from a burning bush, he says. And Moses says to God, what's your name? Who can I tell the Israelites you are? What can I tell them? What can I, who can I tell them is speaking to me? What's your name, God? He says, I am who I am. He says, and he says to them, tell them that I am sent you. So when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, there's no doubt what he's saying. He's saying he's God. You know how I know that? Because right after it, all those who were listening to him picked up rocks and threw them at him trying to start him to death. Because they, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Next. This is the last one. This is right uh, uh, Jesus' uh, trial, right before he's crucified. He's before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious council. They were thought very highly of, and they took him to trial there. He said, again, the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. There you go again. Said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite name for himself, the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And uh, again, we know that they understood because the high priest, apparently back in the day when you got angry, you just like ripped your shirt off or something like that. It says that he just ripped his shirt and like said he's guilty. Um, I just want to read a brief little saying, and this is by C.S. Lewis. Some of you have probably heard this. And it's talking about this idea. And you guys probably, if you're in college right now or whatever, you'll hear this all the time. That Jesus was a great world teacher, but nothing else. So listen, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And then C.S. Lewis dropped the mic. He was done. Um, that's called Lewis's trilemma right there. And basically saying that anybody who makes claims like Jesus, he's either saying he's a liar, on just like the devil, or he's a lunatic, he's crazy, because if people call themselves God today, they generally go to the asylum, or he's God. There's not really many other choices for people who say the kind of things that Jesus did. And if we read the Gospels, we read the accounts of Jesus, the first two options are clear. He's a great guy. He's very smart. He's a great teacher. And uh, we see how what mercy and grace he had for people who wasn't the devil. So, kind of the option seems last option seems right to me. All right, so let's continue. Jesus is, second one, he said, Jesus is God. Second, Jesus is human. He says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. What John's saying here is this guy who's from the beginning of time, okay? He is God. He is the creator of everything. I saw him. I literally saw him. I literally touched him. The guy literally washed my feet. The creator of everything literally washed my feet. And he says this for a couple reasons. He says it because all those guys out there were saying, he's not God. Don't, don't listen to John. He doesn't know him. John comes back and says, I was with him for three and a half years. I knew him personally. He was my best friend. I know him as well as I've known anybody. He comes back at him. Um, Probably the most scandalous verse in the Bible comes to us in that prologue from John that we all already talked about. It says the Word was with God, the Word uh, was from the beginning, the Word was God. 
In verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that might be the most scandalous thing in the whole Bible, that God came down as a man and put on human skin and dwelt among us. It was scandalous at the time, and it's scandalous today. Jesus the God-man come to earth in real time, in a real place. You can go and walk the same ground that Jesus walked 2,000 years ago today. It's just it's hard for me to even grasp that, that God came down as a man. So why does it matter to us today? First and foremost, we don't worship nets. We worship historical, we, we worship an historical person who came down the God-man. A lot of people don't believe that, but look at the evidence. And the second thing is, God wants us to know Him. He would come down on our level. He didn't say, come up. He, he came down to our level to know us. And it makes me think of this awesome kid. Some of you will know who I'm talking about. I'm going to call him Johnny today. Uh, so, I'm a special ed teacher. My first year in Salem Kaiser, I was an instructional assistant. It's about 10 years ago, and I worked with the seventh grader. He was awesome. He had autism. He had no social skills whatsoever. But here's what he would do. He'd he walk around like this. Just wherever he went, he was just, he was the awesomest kid. And he didn't have, like I say, he didn't have good social skills. So like a week like next week, where it's going to be all hot and sunny, the girls would start wearing, you know, like some low shorts and stuff like that. And this is what he would do. He'd basically go up. And he'd point down to the legs and just go, legs! And that's how he talked too. And that was that was that was his talk for I like what you got going on. <laughs> you know? That's what he did. And so this student, like, he was amazing. He had a photographic memory. Okay? So I, I figured out he loved words, and he especially loved words that started with P and O for some reason. It was the weirdest thing. So I got him a dictionary. And he would go through and he'd read through the P section and he just, it would, boom, he just need to read it once, he'd just remember it. And this is how he would do it. Because he couldn't come up and go, hi, Mr. Saturn, how are you today? He couldn't do that. That's not what he did. So this was our conversation. He'd come up to me, he'd tap me on the shoulder, he'd go, meat from a pig. And then I'd do the conjunction, the is or the are, I'd say, is. He'd go, pork! <laughs> <laughs> and then it would be like, very fine china. He go, is? You go, porcelain! <laughs> so, like, I'm, I'm working there, and I got transferred the next year, and I went, um, and I was at a different school, and me and him were really tight. Like, I love the kid, and, and like, I got him, he got me, and uh, I went back the next year, and you could tell he was really excited. He comes out, and he can't, like, say, oh, I'm Mr. Saturday, I missed you. You know what he does? I had to write it down. <laughs> he comes up, and he's just like, a light and strong plastic? And he's just like shaking because he's so excited, right? <laughs> hey, light and strong plastic. I say, yes. He goes, polyethylene! <laughs> but I bring that up because I had to get down on his level. He couldn't come up. I couldn't converse like that. It didn't work out. And that's what God did in Jesus with us. There's no way we can go up and have a conversation with God with Jesus came down on our level so we could converse and so we could have a relationship with God through him. And so the next thing I want to talk about is Jesus not only came down, but he made a way for us to have a relationship with God. Third attribute, Jesus is eternal life. Uh, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. John speaks of Jesus as eternal life. He links him saying that they are one and the same thing. It's basically saying to know Jesus is to have eternal life, and to have eternal life is to know Jesus. Now, we start um, to get kind of offensive here. Because I would say probably the most offensive verse in the Bible right now is John 14, 6. It's where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's offensive today because we live in a world of religious pluralism to say all paths lead to God. All paths lead to God. Um, and Jesus claims exclusively to be the only path to God. He makes that claim. There's no getting around it as a Christian. It's throughout the Bible. Um, so I want to kind of just talk about why he is. Um, as well as I can. I mean, so we've got to start 
back in Eden. Okay, so we're in the Eden. Okay, we have Adam and Eve. They're living in paradise. There are there is nothing but eternal life at this point. There's no such thing as death. And they are in paradise. They were walking through the garden with God in a relationship with God. What every single one of us was intended to do to have a relationship with God. That's why you were born. If you wanted to know why you were born, is to have a relationship with God, a right relationship with God. And so they have that, and they have that. And only God, the only thing God said is don't eat from that tree. And what they do, they ate from the tree. They chose themselves over God. They said, I want to be my own God. And when we sin, that's what we do. Okay? Just we pick ourselves over God. We said, no, my way is better than your way, God. I'm going to do my thing. I mean, if you really want to boil it down, I think that's what sin is. I'm going to do my own thing. And so, when they do that, God kicks them out. Man and God are separated. Because a holy, just God cannot be with a sinful man. Or else he would fail to be holy and just. You see that? perfectly just, he can't be with dirty sinners, because he wouldn't be holy and just anymore, okay? So the whole rest of the Bible, we see this battle between God and man, and just man trying to have that relationship again, and it never works, it never works. But when Jesus comes, he has one purpose, and he is on a mission to fix that problem, and it is the sin problem, that has separated us from God. And his mission is the cross. And so when Jesus goes to the cross willingly, he went because he wanted to. He took on all my sins, my pride, my lust, my greed, my need to be right, all those things. He took upon himself on that cross, and he paid the price that I deserve. He took the wrath of God that I deserve upon myself. He was the only one who was perfect. He's the only one who never sinned. He was like the, the spotless lamb. If anyone shouldn't have been on that cross, it should have been him. But he's the one who took my place and everyone in here's room, in this room's place on that cross. We were talking in Bible study back there this week about think of it like a courtroom. Okay, you're standing before the judge and he goes through every one of your sins that you ever committed. Right when he's about to swing that gavel down and say guilty, Jesus just walks right in front of you and says, No, he belongs to me. I already paid for that. He's mine. The judge says, You're innocent. So, why is Jesus the way? The only way? Because he's the only one who made a way. Buddha might have had some great things to say. He might have been a really smart man, but he didn't die on a cross for me. All I never came down and became a man and died on the cross for me. Plato was really smart, but he never died on the cross for me. And that's why when we say Jesus Christ is the only way, that's what we mean. Because he is the only way. He's the only one who came down and made that way back to God. It says this, God made who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a trade that happens. When we put our faith in Jesus that he died for us, when we trust him with our lives, it says that there's this trade that he takes on our sin and we are seen in his righteousness. We take his righteousness and it's just like him standing right in front of you. And when you're in front of that judge, all he sees is Jesus Christ in his perfect body instead of you and your sins. That's pretty awesome. That's the greatest trade of all time. Next. John writes, we proclaim to you the eternal life which is with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. And all i got to say is good news is for sharing. And everyone loves to talk about good news. Okay? I think the good news is more fun sharing than the good news itself. And I stink at uh, keeping it bottled in when it has to do with me. You know, Laura doesn't like that. Because if I have something good with me, I want to tell the whole world. And something, you, you, should, you shouldn't do that. You know, but I get it. But good news is for sharing. It's like I get really excited about this. That's good. Yeah, I had one of those in San Diego. That is a double bacon cheeseburger from Hodab in San Diego. Maybe the best thing I've ever eaten. It was amazing. Like I could I could sit here and tell you all about it, the textures, what was on it, the cost, what it came with, all these things. Because it's that good and I get excited. Think how like puny and stupid that is compared to the gospel. Like the good news of Jesus Christ. That he came and he died for my sin. Why am I out telling the whole world all the time about Jesus? 
and what he's done. Instead of talking about double bacon cheeseburgers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Good news is for sharing. And uh, we have the best news of all time to share with people. The best news of all time. Uh, and what John was talking about back there, I'm proclaiming the same thing to you today that he proclaimed 2,000 years ago. Jesus got, died on a cross for your sins, and that is the greatest news of all time. That is the gospel that has never changed. Next, it's all about relationships. It says, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Christianity is all about relationships. First and foremost, it's about our relationship with God. Um, not reading the Bible. I know it's hard to read the Bible sometimes. I, don't I mean, I, I enjoy it, okay? It's my passion, but I know it is. I know it's hard to read the Bible. But I think we just think of it in such a different way. Like, if I was starting to date Laura and I was really into her, you know, I, I remember those days, and I wanted to know everything about her. And when you really care about someone, you want to know every single thing you can about that person, right? It's no different with the Bible. The Bible is just the story of God. That's all it is. It's the story of God and what He has done with humanity. And so when I'm reading the Bible, I'm just learning about God. Who I love, who died for me, and all these things. I'm just learning about Him. And he speaks to me, I don't know how many times, like, I've had a question in my life, and that morning, wherever I'm at in the scripture, boom, just spoke right to me. And then prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. It's, it's all about relationship. Okay? What kind of relationship would we have with someone if we never spoke to him? It'd be a pretty crummy relationship, right? That's why God wants us to pray. How amazing is it that the God who created everything commands you to talk to him? You ever thought about that? That he commands you to speak to him. That's our God. That's pretty amazing when you think about that. So it's all about relationships. And, and then we have down here, God calls us into fellowship with each other. And we have relationships with people in the good times and the bad. And when you have a kid that you've got your Christian brothers and sisters, because we are one big giant family. They come around you. They cook you dinner. They help you out. They got your back. And when you go through life's tough times, whether it's death or whatever, that you got people around you to cry with you, to be with you. And when we put this together, when we're talking about love God, love others, makes sense. That's all about relationships. Love is a relational thing. You love God by just having a relationship with Him, talking to Him, reading His Word, obeying His commands, seeking to please Him. You love others just by being selfish, just like Jesus Christ was. And we make disciples. All that is is bringing more people into the family. We just seek to bring more people into the family. But last but not least, John says, share your joy. We write this to make our joy complete. That's kind of weird. Like, I read that first time, like, shouldn't it be their joy complete? You're kind of selfish, John. But what John is talking about is, John finds great joy in bringing others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have ever played a part in that, you know exactly what he's talking about. There's no greater thing than seeing somebody you love, somebody you know, come into a relationship with Jesus and totally be transformed. I've seen heroin addicts just get changed. There's a guy in Minnesota called Dan, and like, dude shared his testimony. He was a Satanist, he was into witchcraft, he was a meth addict, alcoholic, and then he came and he heard the gospel at church one day, and he was just changed. And now he's doing mission trips. I follow him on Facebook. He's in like somewhere in South America right now. I don't remember where. Doing a mission trip. How awesome is that? Just like that we get to play a part in that. That is the coolest thing that God allows us to play a part in that. Um, and really the only reason why I'm up here right now, I'm not up here to lecture you or give you all this. I'm just here to share my joy. That's all this is. Fifteen years ago, you would see me around this town, and you would see me stumbling out of Max, or maybe getting carried out of Max at about two in the morning. I would do any drug you put in front of me. I ate it myself. 
I was depressed. I wanted to die. I thought about suicide quite often. And then in my early 20s, I gave my life to the Lord. I said, I surrender, Lord. I'm done. I'm done. I can't live this way anymore. I'm yours. I belong to you. And slowly and gradually over time, he has just done such amazing things in my life. Those people from 15 years ago were here right now and seeing this. They would call it a miracle because that's exactly what it is. It's a miracle. You think all God's miracles that he did in the Old Testament are awesome? The greatest miracle that God does ever is changing people's hearts and transforming them today. There's no doubt about that. So all I'm doing up here is sharing my joy so that hopefully you have exactly what I have. So I want to end um, with this. It's the timeline of John's life. And what I just want us to learn, we've been talking about John a lot, just from his life. And there's a couple things. There's a lot of young people in this room. Uh, first thing is, if you do the math here, John's about probably 18 years old when he started following Jesus. So what that tells me is age is not a factor. We can all do something for the kingdom of God. No matter how old you are, whether you're in middle school, High school, whether you're a senior citizen, whatever you are, you have a part to play in the kingdom of God. The second thing we can learn is Christian life is not always easy. I've been through rough patches since I gave my life to the Lord. No doubt about that. Look at John. He saw his brother be beheaded. All his best friends got killed. And he's the last one. I think you I would have to think that John was just like, Lord, why? Why? Why are you taking me in? Because he knew where he was going. He knew who he was going to be with. Why would you take him to the yeah, Lord? But he had to do all those things. But no matter how hard it was for him, I know he took great joy in it all. You know how many billions of people God has used John to save? John 3.16 alone. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There have been millions upon millions upon millions of people who have read that verse and given their life to God and been saved. The Holy Spirit just worked through John because he was just an empty vessel. That's what we need to be. We just need to be empty vessels saying, God, fill me up. Let me do your work. I'm done with myself. It's all about you. What do you want from my life? I belong to you. So I want to end with this. I think I've said that like four times. <laughs> okay. I want to look at the beginning. So... When he was 18, or however old he was, we hear this story from Matthew. It's Jesus. Going off together, Jesus, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. This whole thing with John started because of one decision. Jesus came up to him and he called him. He said, Come. I want you guys to know that if you don't know the Lord here today, that he calls you right now. There's a reason why you're here today. He, off, he extends you the same exact offer. That he calls you into a relationship with him. Um, and you see what? John didn't say, Oh, give me, let me finish uh, mending this net real fast with my dad. Oh, I'll get back to you tomorrow. I've got some big things going on tonight. No. It says immediately he left. And uh, you see the response. When Jesus calls, there is a right response. It's called repent and believe. Repentance is nothing but turning. I'm living my life for myself. It's all about me. I'm done with that. I got my back to God because it's all about me right here. God's back here. And then when I turn, I'm done with my own self. I've made that decision. I'm done with that. And I'm going to live my life for you right now, God. That's all repentance is. It's a change. It's based on a decision. And then you believe. Put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord, that he died for you, for you on that cross. And you trust him as your Lord. And now you give your life to the Lord means an ask him. And I give my life to you, Lord. You use me how you want. And uh, so if you're in that boat today, um, jump out. Get out of the boat. God's calling you, um, and uh, just know that while He asked for your life, know that He gave it for you long before He's asking you to give it.